Uh, so let's start uh, today uh, with the uh, help of uh, Princeton University Press and the Columbia Global Center Beijing. We are very pleased to invite Professor Karen uh, Yahimilo of Columbia University uh, to give a talk on her book, uh, Who, Fight, Who Fights for Reputation? Uh, the Psychology of uh, Leaders in the International Conflict, published by the Princeton University Press in 2018, as one of its very uh, uh, prominent book series, Princeton Studies in International History and the Politics. Uh, so the uh, timing uh, is very good for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for this uh, book talk, you know, um, uh, it's uh, the second book, actually. Uh, 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 Professor Karen Milo is the Dean of uh, uh, Columbia University School of International and the Public Affairs, CIPA and director of the uh, Seithman Institute of uh, War and Peace Studies, uh, an expert in international security crisis, uh, uh, decision making and the political psychology. Uh, Dean Yakimilo is now uh, Stevenson Professor of International Relations at the Columbia University. Uh, her book, um, Who Fights for Reputation? The Psychology of, of Leaders in International Conflict uh, which will be discussed today, uh, is the winner of the FPA Distinguished uh, Scholar Award, uh, Foreign Policy Analysis Section of uh, IFA, and the winner of the Best Book Award, Foreign Policy Section of uh, APFA, American Political Science Association. Um, so, and you might know, um, Karen is also the author of Knowing the Adversary, a Leader's Intelligence and Assessment for Intentions in International Relations also published by Princeton University, uh, which has been translated into Chinese uh, and will be included in our book uh, series. Um, uh, you know, the IIF of Peking University, uh, it will go published uh, soon and uh, this year. Uh, that's uh, it's also a very good book. Um, you know, it's uh, the co-winner of the 2016 DPLFT uh, book prize and also the winner of the uh, Furnace Book Award. Um, so today we are very happy to have, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, Karen is our uh, distinguished speaker today. And we have also two uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, guest uh, uh, commentators um, from China. Um, so uh, uh, Professor Zhang Qingmin uh, and Professor Yin Ji Wu, uh, they will join our panel discussion on Karen's book. Um, Professor Zhang uh, is the chair of the Department of Diplomacy at the School of International Studies of uh, Peking University. And his teaching and the research interests include Chinese foreign policy, foreign policy analysis, uh, China and East Asia, uh, he's the author of many books, uh, including uh, China's foreign relations and U.S. arms seals policy toward Taiwan a decision making perspective. He's a leading uh, scholar on foreign policy analysis in our country. Uh, Professor Yin Ji Wu uh, from the School of International Studies of uh, Renmin University of China. Uh, he's a leading scholar in this country in political psychology uh, in international relations. Uh, and has published extensively uh, in this field. Uh, he has uh, been the leader uh, in this field uh, for quite a long time, uh, leading a study group on political psychology uh, research uh, in international relations and also a book series chief editor uh, in this area. Uh, so uh, we are very happy they can uh, join this activity. Um, I'm Yu Tiejun, the moderator of today's book talk uh, from the Institute of International and Strategic Studies, also School for International uh, Studies of Peking University. Uh, so in the following, uh, we will first invite uh, Karen to uh, deliver her keynote speech for about half an hour. And then uh, Professor uh, Zhang and Professor Yin uh, will give their comments 
Uh, each of you will have uh, about 15 minutes or so. And then we will move to the discussion and the Q&A session uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, so without further ado, uh, please join me to welcome uh, Professor Karen Yahimiro to give her talk. Uh, Karen. Uh, uh Thank you. It is wonderful to be with you. I am very excited uh, to present the book uh, to this audience in particular. Very excited that the books are have been translated uh, to Chinese and, um, and to have an opportunity to talk about my research uh, these days uh, is, is just amazing because um, I am now the Dean of the School of International Public Affairs. And as you can imagine, being a Dean is you do a lot of really interesting, cool stuff, but uh, talking about research and books is 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 really, um, uh, I you know, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of time left to do this. So when this opportunity comes, uh, came, I was delighted uh, to talk about the book, to come and, and, and talk about the book. Uh, but you will have to also excuse me because it's been a while since I published this book. So for me, I had to kind of go back and refresh my memory, what it is that I exactly said and claimed and how did I do it? So this was also a very nice opportunity to go back to this. So uh, what I will do today is give you an overview of the book, the different uh, pieces of it. Um, and uh, it's almost kind of a way for me to go back and say, you know, it's a very, you know, it's an argument about the psychology of leaders and but it's also a way of um, hopefully uh, a model of how we can study um, things like uh, psychological um, uh, variables and how do we study personality of leaders as a causal uh, uh, variable in foreign policy analysis. So what I was trying to do here is beyond the argument is to offer some sort of a um, a way for students of international relations to study this more systematically. So I will share the screen and I will try to go quickly over different parts. There's a lot to cover. Let's see if I can, is this, I think it's this the one maybe. Uh, can you, no, let's, I'm sorry, let's do slideshow. Um, bear with me for a second. Is this a slideshow? Can you see it as a slideshow? No, one, one second. Let me try it again. It worked before, but, um, Okay, let's see this. Sorry about this. It just still shows my um my notes. Okay, should be now. Share screen. Okay, let me know. Does this work? Yes. Oh, yes, great. Yeah. great. Okay, great. Um, all right, so, okay, so when, uh, when I started working on this, uh, you have to remember this was back in the time, right after President Obama backed down from the red line, he is posed from the Syrian, to the Syrian leader, if you remember, when he said that if the Soviets, you know, if, if Russia would, you know, uh, would use chemical weapons, the United States would intervene, and he backed down, and that had created a kind of another round in the debate about reputation, um, which was, you know, does it matter? Should leaders care about reputation and so on? That was a long, it's a long standing debate in the field of international relations, dating back even before uh, uh, Vietnam, but obviously Vietnam, it sparked again with the red line in Syria. You got it after the book was published with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And now with Putin's invasion of Ukraine, that question becomes always relevant. 
I have a line of work uh, that with Alex Weisinger that I published showing that reputation for resolve matters, that leaders who back down you know, are more likely to be challenged again. But what this book tried to do is take another part of this question that we haven't really engaged with. It is a related question that both the Obama case um, highlighted very effectively, but one that received far less attention from IR scholars, uh, scholars. And it is a question of why do we see variation in decision makers, decision makers' concerns about reputation for resolve? Why some leaders are worried and even obsessed about protecting reputation for resolve, are willing to take costly action um, just to cultivate an image of resolve, even when you don't have vital interests at stake, material in interest at stake, and while others, like Obama, who actually you know, uh, interviewed on this question, saying we should not fight for reputation, this is the worst uh, uh, reason to fight for. So why some are not willing to do this? Why some presidents are willing to fight purely for face or image? Um, and others are not. And even the, the ones that are willing to fight for reputation, are at times even, um, you know, they're less hawkish in general compared, they're not considered hawks at all. And yet we see them fighting for reputation and face. Um, so there is something that cannot be explained just by propensity to use military force. It cannot be explained by being a Democrat or Republican. So there's something else going on. And so we see this variation, and what this book is trying to do is to say, well, we can talk about what explains it in terms of situational variables, the strategic environment, and all of that. But I will argue that those kinds of variables fail to, you know, there's still something very important that's missing from those kinds of explanations. And what you really want to do is provide an alternative analytical framework to understanding this pattern. And that focuses on psychological disposition and beliefs of national leaders. Now, for many of you, it should not come as a surprise. I'm a student of Bob Jervis. Uh, he was my mentor, uh, even as starting as an undergrad. So the idea that, that you know we have to take leaders seriously, we have to take beliefs and psychology of leaders seriously, is very, uh, very important. Um, and I think establishing the literature um, and but what this book tries to do is offer micro foundations for understanding of where reputational concerns come from. And I say they come from the psychology of the leaders and what types of leaders are more likely to fight for them. Now, I would argue that the argument in this book has fundamental implications for understanding um, U.S. conflict history, but also contemporary policy debates about military interventions, crisis escalation, and stability, and the application of military force um, more, um, uh, more generally. So if you look at it, kind of the guiding question, so what explains the variation that we see? And I argue this is not as straightforward as we would might, you know, we might think. And also what type of individuals is likely to fight for a face and why? So let's talk about um, um, what it is to so fight for reputation for resolve. What, how do we define this? So the book I define it is to threaten or to use military force in order to affect others' beliefs about one's willingness to stand firm in the current and future crisis. Okay, that's how the definition of fighting. Um, and fighting for reputation um, is different from fighting for pure material intrinsic interests. Now, the two sometimes can coexist. You can fight for reputation and materials interests at the same time. But we also, what I am mainly interested in is looking at the idea of why they use force or threat to use military force, even when those vital interests are not at stake. So what explains this? Um, so what I'm trying um, to do is leaders, uh, the argument, and you will can see this in the book, uh, leaders who fight for reputation, uh, I will argue that they have a willingness uh, to risk uh, uh, war for appearance, 
because again, this is not about material vital interest. So there is something about an image, the cultivation of an image. They believe that they have the ability to shape their image because otherwise you would not have you know, uh, uh, even try to go for uh, this type of endeavor. So they have a belief in their ability to shape their image. They have an inclination, this is the psychology, they have an inclination to manipulate their per perceived interest because after all, when you fight for something that is not a vital interest, you need to convince the other side that something is important for you and you were willing to escalate even though the material interests are not there. So you have to have some ability to uh, an inclination to manipulate others' perceptions. And they have a motivation to be perceived as resolved during international crisis. So why resolve? Why not as peacemakers? Why not as uh, compliance with international uh, law? Why is it that they want to show resolve? Those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. What types of leaders, what type of people of individuals, what type of psychological profile fit people who would uh, uh, check all of those boxes. And what I argue is that those leaders, we call them in the literature, um, high self monitors, right? So that's what uh, the book is. And it basically shows that um, there are two ideal types um, that if you look at the literature from psychology about self-monitoring, they're low and high, and the high self-monitor leaders are the one who have the psychological profile that I will argue, uh, or that I argue in the book and show in the book with lots of evidence that those are the kinds of leaders who are much, much more likely to fight for reputation regardless of their political party, regardless of their, whether or their hawks or doves and so on. So, what I'm going to uh, to do today very quickly is to talk a little bit about this theory. And again, it's all in the book and I'm not going to try to summarize the book for you. I'm just going to give you highlights. Um, talk about this theory. What are the self-monitoring? What are the effects, the mitigating effects of hawkishness? What are the theoretical prediction? But I think the interesting part, even more interesting part in this theory, which we can talk about, is how we test this, right? How do we test an argument about the psychology, the personality of leader in a systematic way. How can we do this to reduce, to minimize bias, um, to go beyond one case or one leaders, to kind of say, here's a pattern that we can really believe in the, in the importance of self-monitoring and what are the implications? So the testing is, what you will see is what we call in the literature, you know, in political science, this is, you know, multi-method approach. We have uh, uh, cross-national server experiments that, that we did. Uh, there is statistical analysis of crisis behavior of all US presidents during the Cold War. And we have uh, um, um, case studies that in the book, there are many more uh, case studies that look at archival documents to really show this in action. So this is a really, you know, multi-method approach to testing different elements of the theory. Um, but let me um, just say um, a few things just before we go to the theory is really that um, this is about the psychology of decision-making. This is not the first book that looks at psychology of decision-making, of decision-makers, but it is the first book that really tries to systematically study a particular psychological trait, a personality trait of leaders and how it affects reputation for resolve. And it's probably the first one, the first book that looks at where reputational concerns come from and identifies them as not coming from the environment, but coming from within the leader, from his psychology, his or her psychology. So that's that's what it is. And the last part I would say is it's really a template uh, for us to hopefully, uh, the students uh, who are maybe, you know, hopefully um, here with us today can take and study and use to study other type of personality traits because this book offers a template of how to do this. Okay. So um, what is self-monitoring? And again, 
we don't have a whole lot of time to get into this, but this is, you know, you can read a lot of it about it in the book. The book, the, the, the argument here is that it, you know, we first draw on the work of the sociologists Erwin Goffman, Thomas Schelling, and Robert Jervis. When they start, when they talked uh, about international relations, they kept, you know, especially Bob drawing on on both Schelling, uh, Jervis drawing both on Schelling and Goffman, say that state leaders constantly engage in impression management on the international state. This is what, I mean images are about. Impression management of self-presentation is a process by which a person attempts to control how he is viewed from another person's perspective. That's what impression management is. Now, self-presentation is fundamental to human nature. And Jervis's work established that self-presentation is also fundamental to how states communicate in international politics. Leaders use impression management in the form of signals, as you know from Jervis's work, to control their image in the eyes of different international audiences, right? So we know that leaders and states use impression management. However, what the literature and psychology has told us since the work of Bob Jervis from the 1970s is that the degree to which people use strategic self-presentation depends on essentially a trait, that that trait that they are born with, right? It's not something that they acquire during their life, they're born with it, uh, are called self-monitoring. So self-monitoring concerns the extent to which individuals strategically cultivate their public appearances in social situation. And the literature dis distinguishes between two ideal types of individual the high self-monitors and the low self-monitors. Now you have people that are in between, but those are ideal types. High self-monitors are what we call image mavens. They are particularly sensitive to external social cues about their behavior. They tend to strategically modify and adapt their behavior to a given social situation. And importantly, they do this in order to increase their social status by establishing a desired image of themselves. So it's not just the idea of they, you know, they just modify their behavior, but they do this in a very strategic way to enhance their social status. Um, they are called other directed and their self-presentation is, is aimed at impressing external audiences. That's the trait. They have high expressive self-control, which means that they can modify easily their outward behavior. They have great acting skills um, together with a great social stage presence. That is the degree to which they draw attention to themselves. And those are really the permanent uh, features of high self-monitors. That's a psychological trait. We, Some of us have it. Some of us are low self-monitors. But the self-presentation of the high self-monitor, what I want to emphasize, it does not reflect a passive conformity to others. It's not about just doing what others are doing, but it's a strategic means of image projection and status, status cultivation. That is key. So that's on the one hand, the high self-monitors. And I will argue that those types of individual, when you put them in power as, as presidents, as leaders, you will see very assertive behavior fighting for reputation for our face. The low self-monitors, on the other hand, they are controlled by their own attitudes and beliefs. They derive pleasure and satisfaction, not by projecting it as a strategically uh, uh, cultivated you know, uh, image, but from being sincere and presenting a behavior that is consistent with their beliefs across different types of situations. They lack a desire to strategically construct what they perceive as a false image of themselves. So there's nothing, none of this manipulation of interests and all of that. And so um, that's really the kind of two ideal types that we're going to study. And I'm going to show you that the high and the low you know, leaders significantly vary in their propensity to use military force for reputational uh, considerations. 
Now, the reason I'm able to, I was able to write uh, this book is because in the literature, we have an established scale to measure self-monitoring. There is a, a questionnaire that the literature that scholars came up with. And the other important part is that you can measure this accurately for other people. So that, as you will see in a second, become very important. And the last part that I will say is, is, uh, uh, is important is that it's a stable trait uh, among adults. So it is has some genetic components. So it doesn't vary during the time of your life. You cannot teach it. Um, and they're not highly correlated with the big five personality traits. So we don't have those uh, problem and it's not correlated with hawkishness or political ideology, which is also important, important for us uh, as, as we will engage in terms of how do we uh, identify uh, the trait and how do we measure this as an independent uh, variable. So very quickly, what is the uh, uh, connecting self-monitoring to reputation? So there are different theoretical predictions that we can generate about the behavior of leaders using the self-monitoring trait. But this book focuses specifically on their behavior during militarized international crisis, right? You can write a different book about high self-monitors and climate negotiations or in, in other, you know, other areas. This is about military crises. And I will uh, uh, argue that um, they are uh, here. Let, let's, let's move here. This is more. Um, they are concerned, uh, the high self-monitors during international crisis are more likely to be concerned about establishing a positive reputation in the eyes of international audiences. That's the first hypothesis. Because high self monitors are more concerned about the perceptions of others, they're more sensitive than low self monitors to the reactions of external audiences in crisis. And concerned about how others might judge them, the high self monitors are attentive to signals from allies and adversaries that might give them clues as to how they are perceived. High self monitors are especially likely to be willing to fight for reputation when they are reminded, when they are reminded that others are watching them. And this is going to be key, that they need to know that there is an audience who watch them and then that cues them to act and become more resolved and fight for reputation for resolve. And you will see this, that, um, this is um, uh, in the experiments, you will see that when we treat high self-monitor people, all of a sudden they become more hawks. They become more willing to fight for reputation. Nothing changes in terms of interest, but only that you cue them that there are people watching them. It does not happen for the low self-monitor, right? Now, in this book, I argue, and we can talk about it, that the international audiences matter for the high self-monitors much more than for uh, than domestic audiences. Uh, but we can talk about this and can show this uh, uh, empirically how, um, how international audiences and domestic audiences kind of play a role. Um, the second hypothesis is that the high self-monitors seek a reputation for resolve because they view it as enhancing their social status. And that gets us to the kind of why. Why do they fight for reputation for resolve in militarized dispute? And I argue that um, um, in different contexts, you will see how self-monitors care about different things. But what the literature shows us that across all of those contexts, they fight for, they behave in a way that they believe will accord them higher social status. And that is very important um, to understand that in, in the case of um, international military crisis, resolve is the social currency. And this is why it will change if you move from crisis to negotiations over climate agreement, where resolve might not be the social currency. But in, in international militarized dispute, we know that this is the most important one. The literature has documented this. And so all else equal, you will see them thinking about being resolved as meaning having higher status. 
So that's why you see them acting this way. Um, and the third thing is that they utilize military instru instruments and signals to demonstrate their willingness to stand firm. So what is this hypothesis? This hypothesis is that it's not just um, um, uh, in the realm of thinking about, you know, wanting to appear more resolved or whatever. It's actually taking action and manipulate their interests through those actions um, by taking, you know, by using military force, by threatening to, to use military force uh, only for reputational reasons. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, and, 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 and so they act on that impulse of uh, wanting to appear resolved and not just, it's not just in their head, but they actually see demonstrations of it. All right, now, up until now, I tried to convince you that there is something about a psychological trait, the personality trait of leaders that matter a lot. But there is an inter in moderating effect of the baseline degrees of hawkishness versus dovishness. So hawkishness or dovishness refers to the overall general beliefs about how much military force is useful, how and how much or what kind of military force is useful instrument to achieve political ends. Um, and so what we're looking at here is that I'm going to argue that there is uh, an interplay between hawks and doves and self-monitoring. Doves are less likely to resort to military instruments to solve crisis. But what is really interesting is that within the population of doves, there is huge difference between the high self-monitor doves and the low self-monitor doves. It's the low self-monitor doves that are not going to fight for reputation, but it's the high self-monitor doves that will fight for reputation much more significantly because of the psychological uh, uh, predisposition that I'm arguing. So that I'm arguing are very important. So if you see in the book, you will see that there is, that produces a two by two that gives you uh, a four ideal types of reputation crusader, reputation skeptic, uh, believer and critique, depending on the high self-monitoring and the, the, uh, the predisposition in terms of utility of military force, which means hawkishness. So, if you want, I can give, I can go over it, but the reputation critique, for example, it's a low self-monitor uh, leader who is a dove. That kind of a leader will not use military force, neither for, you know, all else equal, not for strategic interest, but definitely not for reputation. It's the reputation crusader that we will see is a high self, I'm sorry, the reputation believer is a high self-monitor uh, dove who is going to be uh, uh, become much more militant when reputation for resolve is at stake. Um, and you see this, we will see this very nicely in the empirical uh, chapters. And then you have also differences between the hawks. The low self-monitor hawks, they fight, but they don't fight for the same reason as the high self-monitor hawks. The low self-monitor hawks fight for uh, material interest, they fight, you know, they want to, uh, you will see them using instruments like increasing defense spending and all that. But the high self-monitor hawks, they fight for reputation too, uh, just like the high self-monitor uh, doves. And so you will see hawks as fighting, more likely to fight all of, I mean, all else equal, but for different reasons. And we will see this also in the experiments, in the case studies, what is the differentiating factor between them? Um, we're moving to the testing. And again, I don't know how much time I will um, have to go over everything. You just give me cue when it's five minutes uh, before I have to stop. So here is really, uh, um, again, I don't wanna summarize the book for you, but what you will see in the book and different people will be drawn to different parts of it, is how do we test this, right? And so we start with uh, cross-national survey experiments. And what they're really, really good at doing is establishing the micro foundations. This is where we directly ask respondents, uh, they take the test of self-monitoring, 
Uh, they take a test about uh, coding themselves as hawks versus doves. So we have really good measures. And then it is a control setting. Uh, so what we do is we manipulate uh, the reputational treatment that they get, um, and we will talk about it. And we can also ask them questions about what was it that motivated them in the scenarios that they were getting, whether or not to fight. So we really get direct evidence about motivation, and we kind of see whether it matches the prediction. So that's what the, the, the survey experiments allow me to do, is offer this micro foundation. But then, you know, when you do survey experiments, you do this um, with uh, citizens. I mean, I did do them with uh, Israeli decision makers too, members of the parliament in Israel. But mainly you look at uh, individuals and you give them a crisis scenario and it's a little bit manufactured. So you wanna be skeptical about what you're getting from those experiments. You have to bring it to the real world. And how do you bring it to the real world? So this is where the statistical analysis of crisis behavior of US presidents from Truman uh, uh, to, uh, to Bush, and here we do, we look at um, how leaders, real leaders, real leaders behave and behaved in crisis uh, and have a measure that is more generalizable. Obviously the biggest issue there is how do we code the self-monitoring of US presidents? And this is where uh, you will see in the book an innovative approach by uh, asking presidential historians who studied the presidents, uh, a particular president, and gave them the questionnaire in a very particular way, and I will explain how to minimize bias, to code the different presidents, um, and then use that, uh, apply this in, uh, against the data set of the militarized interstate dispute, and really show a very beautiful trend about uh, separation of the high self monitors from the low self monitors, And we can show generalizability across time. And yet people will say, well, okay, this is a statistical analysis. This is kind of all else equal. We see this, uh, this trend, but can we find evidence for the causal mechanism in particular cases? Can we link the discourse to the behavior? Can we test this on other people? Maybe not just the president, maybe the advisors. And, um, and how can we evaluate other contextual explanations? And that's what required us in the required me in this third part of the book to really go into the case studies and show uh, how those uh, variables are in action. How does this concerns about reputation fueling uh, um, um, uh, action and and military, you know, and 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 uh, military signals and all of that. And how a president like Carter, who is a low self monitor, is resisting those types of arguments uh, when Brzezinski, his national security advisors, who is a high self monitor, uh, is trying to uh, advance those. So, um, how much time do I have in order, you know, do I have time to go over some of this or should I skip to the conclusion and, and leave more room for questions? So um, why not just uh, skip to the conclusion? So uh, okay. we have so two discussions. Perfect. So what, um, what I want to basically show you just when I, when we say, how does the US presidents fare in terms of the low self monitoring and, and so on over time, I just want to show you that um, uh, to show you that there is some variation uh, among you know, US presidents in the Cold War in terms of being high or low based on the questionnaires by historians. But you should not be surprised that we actually have in the United States uh, more high self-monitor leaders than low self-monitor leaders. And that if you, if you listen to what I said about the traits of self, high self-monitors, you will not be surprised why they are, why they end up as presidents to begin with. That's very much related to uh, what the traits of politicians are, or very you know, uh, skilled politicians uh, to be able to get to that. 
Um, all right, so all of the slides that I have, and I'm happy to go over them uh, in the Q&A, are really the uh, uh, showing support, uh, overwhelming support for the argument. If you want to know the cases uh, in the book, um, so I'm looking at three presidents. Um, Jimmy Carter is a reputation critique. He is a low self-monitored dog. And I'm looking at the crisis behavior during the uh, Soviet activities in the Horn of Africa, uh, the Soviet brigade in Cuba in 1979, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And I'm showing uh, 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 Carter's resistance to fight for reputation, even though uh, his uh, national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, a high self-monitor, constantly pushed him. And you see this very nicely in the documents. Then I look at Ronald Reagan, who is obviously a high self-monitor, an actor, uh, high self-monitor hawk. Um, and I'm looking at his intervention in Lebanon, Grenada, the war in Afghanistan, and the bombing in Libya. And I show that Ronald Reagan and Casper Weinberger, both are hawks, but one is a high self-monitor and one is a low self-monitor, fought for very different reasons. Ronald Reagan, like George Shultz, cared so much about reputation, and George Shultz was also a high self-monitor, cared so much about credibility and reputation for resolve that it made them uh, 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 want to fight more. Uh, definitely in Grenada, you know, withdrawing from Lebanon when he felt that he, was, he had no option, and then the next day going to Grenada to show resolve. Casper Weinberger's low self-monitor was very much against this, and we have Bill Clinton, who is a great example of a high self-monitor dove, who very much so uh, fought for reputation and cared a lot about reputation for resolve uh, in the crisis in Somalia, Haiti, and Taiwan Strait car uh, uh, crisis. So this is kind of how you look at the documents and you see this. This I can, I can talk a lot about archival document and really excellent evidence uh, of showing the, 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 the dispute between uh, Carter and Brzezinski, for example, over reputation uh, for resolve. Okay, so the just to kind of conclude, um, what I'm basically telling you is a story and an argument that is uh, not the conventional wisdom. I am telling you that concerns for reputation are essentially pre-political. And I'm arguing that international relations is constructed from the bottom up, not just from the leaders, uh, but really from the psychology of leaders and something that they're born with. And the, the people that we get as leaders, their psychology, their personality traits matter a lot. And the other thing I do is I offer um, a new mechanisms that explains how, how leaders' personalities shape international conflict, in what way it does that. And so that's kind of reading the book and reading the evidence, you will see that this is very much about the how, not just the why. The other thing is that it debunks existing explanation for when and why and who fights for reputation. The argument that hawks fight for reputation and doves do not is wrong. It's just wrong. Uh, and I will, you know, I basically show that there is significant variation within the hawks and among the doves. And again, as I say, it's a template for studying the psychology of leaders in a novel and parsimonious way. Um, happy to go over this at QA. Huge implications for intelligence analysis of foreign leader self-monitoring. I've been doing a lot of that too. Um, a lot of implications on how we should think about crisis stability and escalation when we're dealing in a dyad, when you have high and high, low and low, um, and a mix. What does it do if you have those dyads uh, in crisis over reputation? under what condition you will see escalation and under what conditions you might see more stability. Um, how the framing and the discourse during crisis matters a lot, especially if the psychology of the leader is really driving a lot of what we see, then how leaders talk about uh, and frame about the, the crisis and what is a win and what is a loss would matter a lot. 
And it also has implications for public support for the use of force because what I'm showing you is also that there is differences among the public between high self-monitors and low self-monitors. So if you want to have support for an adventure that is not about material interest, you might be able to use reputational language to attract uh, support from even people who are doves uh, to your cause. The high self monitor doves will be very much uh, uh, treated by a reputational law, uh, language. So there is implications for maintaining support for uh, uh, the use of force for reputational reasons that that affects you know, public opinion and so on. So that's what um, I have uh, for you. I, I hope that this just gives you a glimpse into what the book does, but really the most interesting part is the empirical parts that I didn't have time to talk about, but that's what I hope that you will go and get a copy of the book and enjoy reading. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Looking forward to hearing the comments and questions. And I'll stop sharing. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen, uh, for uh, giving us a very clear introduction of uh, your uh, theoretical framework, uh, you know, the key arguments, uh, very solid, you know, uh, multi-methodology uh, and the policy uh, implications um, uh, from this book. Um, so uh, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Zhang Qingmin to uh, comment. Uh, Qingmin, please. Okay, I'll thank you, Jiujin, uh, for offering this opportunity to join this book discussion. And, and I learned a lot uh, from the reading, and I also learned a lot from the presentation just now. And uh, let me yeah, discuss the following point. I think uh, first I would like to congratulate you, Karen, it's a wonderful book. And uh, this is a very important step forward in the psychological studies in foreign policy analysis. Uh, because uh, international relations are interpeople relations, and the foreign policies are not made by abstract, uh, abstract uh, state state, but by people individually or collectively in the name of a state. It is very, very difficult to understand state behavior without understanding the people who act in the name of state. In psychology, you know, especially after the end of Cold War, political psychology become you know more popular. There have been a lot of studies, uh, either for, uh, uh, either further on belief or personality, image, and motivation, or sensitivity to the environment. I think Carrie's book, you know, noticed that there is something that has that cannot explain the, some of the puzzles in the, the real world, and so uh, this book developed a new framework. Uh, you know, finding an important independent variable that is uh, self-monitoring and uh, reputation. Uh, this is, these variables have not been paid enough attention and uh, to see nothing of uh, detailed studies. And uh, from this perspective, I think this book is not just a, 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 a reminiscence of uh, earlier studies. It's a very important step. Uh, this is the first point I want to make. And the second point I want to make is, is that the method and the logic of this research are especially commendable. Uh, from the presentation uh, just now, uh, I got to know how uh, she came to, uh, you know, find such an interesting topic or question and do such an interesting research. Uh, unlike many of other books in this field, which either avail uh, quantitative research or qualitative research, and uh, this book combined experimental or non-experimental survey, text analysis, and statistical quantitative research, and the uh, process tracing case studies. I especially like uh, the three cases because it offers a lot of empirical, you know, uh, evidence to demonstrate and also to, you know, to uh, support how the theories uh, proposed in the first three chapters or first chapters were employed. So when I read the book, uh, I, 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 I tried to be critical because I wanted to, you know, find some contradictory cases so that I can use today 
as I continue to read, uh, as I read the book, I find a lot of, you know, some of the cases which uh, does not seem to be in line with uh, her theory. But as I continue to read, I found uh, that uh, he would, the book would, you know, he, she would clarify the situation by uh, prescribing a limit to its uh, applica applicability. For example, uh, there are four categories or four kinds of leaders according his, uh, you know, a diagram. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, there was only three cases. Uh, I was about to ask this question, why there are four kinds of leaders you study, only three, you know, uh, uh, leaders. And then I find uh, this was explained. So I was thinking about other policies. And then I realized this book is about fighting for reputation and not just, uh, you know, general foreign policy or general, you know, wars. You know, there are a lot of wars, you know, a lot of reasons for wars. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that research is focused on, you know, the fight is for reputation, not a general for, for wars. So uh, I think uh, this is very wise and also, uh, you know, uh, the good idea uh, to say, well, to, because uh, some books like to propose a very general propositions uh, to see, to make sh appear that their books can be applicable to all cases. I think uh, uh, this is a very wise and safe way to develop a theory and to, to, for a theory to not only to survive and thrive uh, because in the future, we may not be able to develop some theory that is generally appli universally appli applicable. Uh, we have to define and you know, refine uh, you know, you know, the certain conditions or situations that the theory is, is, can be used. I think from this perspective, I think this is a very good job because I cannot refute, I cannot find you know, evidence or cases to refute or disagree. Uh, so this is the second point. I think the logic and the method is really uh, you know, commendable. And the third point I want to make is about uh, uh, the title and the way uh, you know, how it was structured. And I also want to avail this opportunity to raise a question to Karen uh, that I always uh, was raised, always raised in my class of foreign policy analysis. To the, the answer to the question of this book title, who fight, who fight for reputation can be boiled down to a very short sentence. That is uh, those who care about reputation will fight for reputation. Those who do not care about reputation, they will not fight for, for reputation, even though they fight. So, uh, so the three cases demonstrate the reputation crusader, you know, uh, who you know, with high self-monitoring and uh, hawks uh, care more about reputation for resolve, and they fight more, but they fight more for reputation. So. Uh, in your book, you, you, you said that it is very, very difficult. It is not a lot of, you know, reputation uh, skeptics, uh, those, you know, hawks uh, who fight, uh, you know, who, who do not fight for reputation. Uh, this, is, this is very, very interesting. I, I have not, uh, you, know, uh, you know, find it, you know, a uh, reason even you explained why such kind of leader uh, is not so many and you cannot find a, a good case. To, to demonstrate this kind of leader. So the other two cases that, you know, Reagan, Carter, uh, the three cases, Reagan, Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter, and, uh, and uh, Clinton, uh, they are very good cases to, to demonstrate the theory and support the theory. So the result is not unexpected. It, it reminds me a puzzle that I have or a question my, my students always raise in my foreign policy classes. That is in psychological studies, there's a phenomenon uh, called is a cyclical reasoning. That is in order to find the personality, personal tra personality trait like belief or personality or worldview or other personality traits. We refer to their language or some of their behaviors. Uh, including foreign policy behavior, including war. But at the same time, we wanted to understand how this kind of person personality traits affected a, a leader's foreign policy behavior. In this regard, the first step on the foreign policy, the leader's personality seems to be the, the dependent variable. 
But when we study foreign policy, the personality or personal traits became an independent variable. So it seems to be a phenomenon that we always use a foreign policy behavior or language to, to, to find uh, that, that personal trait. And then we use their personal traits to explain foreign policy behaviors. Uh, this kind of phenomenon came up, you know, a person came up to my, uh, in my class very often. So I, I want to use this opportunity to uh, you know, ask Karen, how would you respond to your students and to our students to this question? The fourth point is that uh, I would like to, you know, raise uh, several questions. Uh, that is, uh, so th th there are four, you know, categories of leaders, uh, the crusader skeptics and uh, believer and uh, crit uh, critic uh, critics. So, uh, it's better for those uh, crusaders. I think uh, both the, the crusaders and the skeptics, they fight often because they believe in the effects of a, a war. So they are hawks. But it is very difficult to find that, uh, you know, when they fight, you know, to what extent that 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 you know the uh, the crusade or the the concern for reputation for revolve uh, play a role. Uh, to what extent it does not play a role? I think you explain it in that book, but I find that for those skeptics, they fight the their their re reputation concern does not matter. So I think that might be a, 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 a at least I I have not figured out from reading um, to solve this problem. And the second problem I, I have is that uh, a puzzle I have is while reading this book is that uh, when we, you talk about uh, self monitoring and uh, reputation for uh, resolve, uh, sometimes it seems that the reputation is the leader's personal reputation, you know, whether he is uh, uh, determined or resolved, uh, resolute or not. Sometimes it seems to be wanted to show that the leader care about the reputation of the country or the nation. And uh, quite often I understand that they are the same, but uh, sometimes uh, they are not exactly the same. It's just like in bureaucratic politics, the interest of the president is not always the same as the interest of uh, the state of the country. So the reputation concern of the leader might not be the same reputation concern for the nation. So how to distinguish that? Uh, and uh, so the fourth, the fifth point I want to make is that uh, this is really a promising framework. I, I think uh, uh, it will become more and more popular and uh, it will be used by other scholars. And I will try in this regard. But to make it more prevalent in foreign policy analysis, uh, this nuanced method may need to develop easier tools or procedures to calculate the level or scale of self-monitoring because it is not easy to identify the skill of a leader's self-monitoring because you you spend a lot of time and did a very good job to you know have a uh, statistics and you know the figures about the american president's you know self-monitoring skill uh, and when i talk about this i was thinking about uh, uh, the other uh, method in political psychology like uh, the operational code uh, framework. You know, Stephen Walker used the verb in context of the system to find the find out the leader's operational code, and it's it's, it's a computerized system. And like Margaret Herman's leader evaluation and assessment at a distance method, I think uh, uh, perhaps the next step, uh, 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 more effort could be made to develop a certain, you know, such kind of procedures so that this method and this framework can be more often, you know, used and become more popular and prevalent in the study of foreign policy. The last point I want to make is about, uh, you know, whether uh, this kind of framework could be employed to study other countries' foreign policy. You know, as a Chinese, I always think about whether this can be used to study Chinese foreign policy because I noticed the political scientists who study individuals intentionally exclude the cultural factors. 
And you also uh, exclude the cultural difference in your study, but uh, for reasons very easy to understand, uh, you extend your framework to Israel. <laughs> Comparatively speaking, as you argued, explained in your book, that uh, leaders in democratic countries are less important due to domestic constraints, uh, but they care more about uh, reputation due to domestic audience cost. Well, in non-democratic countries, I was thinking other countries uh, where leaders uh, do not have, you know, uh, you know, domestic, uh, you know, audience cost constraints. They do not need to take into consideration the domestic, uh, you know, uh, situation. But uh, sometimes they are very, very powerful. Sometimes they are predominant leader, uh, and uh, for this kind of leader, they have, they do not care about, they do not need to care about the reputation, but uh, they have uh, more freedom. Perhaps whether you know the framework you develop in this book could be used to study this kind of you know scenario. Uh, you know, as uh, Ian Johnston from Harvard and other scholars, China scholars have sh their study has shown have shown that uh, there's no audience cost in China because we do not have those kind of election uh, in the West. And so they are argumented that the Chinese leaders can back down freely and easily in international you know, crisis without having domestic backfire. So this book reminds me that Chinese, uh, Ch Ch Chinese, uh, China, uh, Chinese leaders, but they do care about reputation. Sometimes they talk about reputation very, very often, but in the past we neglected this kind of you know, factor. From your book, and I began to pay a lot of atten pay attention to how our leaders talk about the, the, the reputation and how this kind of reputation concern will affect the Chinese foreign policy in general, not you know, in a particular in Chinese use of a force. We have not been, China has not used force for a long, long time. So, because in China we have a saying, Chinese diplomacy is always termed as a fist-sifting diplomacy. So, uh, I, I, I have a employed a Peggy Herman's uh, Jervis theory to the study of Chinese foreign policy. I think this book stimulates a strong desire for me to employ your framework to the study of a Chinese foreign policy. I may come to your help in the future. <laughs> so, I, 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 let me wrap up. Here. In one word, it is, this is a very, very good research, a very good book, a excellent book. It's a milestone in the leadership research. As I learned a lot from it, that, from it and I, I, my impression is that our understanding of how leadership shape foreign policy is, is important, as you said at the, at the end of your presentation. But I find out the more we learn, the more complex, you know, com you know, uh, uh, you know, perplex we feel because we find that the reality, how personality shape foreign policy, is become more and more important. You know, more and more complicated than we thought before we started reading such books. So the value of this book in, lies not only in your new framework and the new independent variable you have, you know, found, or the answer you have also uh, offered to the question you raised. But I think it lies in the question it raises, and they had a lot more questions that come out from your book which will inspire more people to dig deeper along the way to find more variables, you know, to study how lead individual leaders shape foreign policy. And with that, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much, Qingmin. Uh, so uh, uh, let, let, uh, let's first turn to uh, Ji Wu uh, uh, for his comments, and then uh, I think uh, uh, Karen can wrap up, you know, uh, 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 response uh, together um, yes. for the all two commentators. Uh, Ji Wu, uh, take your way, please. All right. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, first. Uh, mm. I want to show my thanks to 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 Tianjin and other organizers for the effort to provide this platform. So, so personally, I can get this opportunity to share my uh, thinking uh, on the political psychology research with uh, 
the colleagues from the United States and my colleagues at the Peking University. So um, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, Professor Kenneth's book uh, uh, on reputation, uh, personally, I really enjoy uh, reading uh, Kenneth's latest book on uh, reputations. Uh, and I think in, uh, the book is uh, one of the most uh, sophisticated or rigorous and uh, uh, it's very original, also, also convincing work in this field. Uh, uh, also, I think an offer which uh, make it a great contribution, uh, both theoretically and uh, methodologically, uh, in terms of the political psychology uh, studies in international relations. So uh, here, um, I strongly recommend this book to my students, uh, um, both in my classes and uh, my uh, students sponsored um, by myself or uh, supervised by myself in my university and my uh, colleagues. Uh, so here, I just want to uh, thank Ken for her great effort to, uh, or in needing this new trend. Uh, a so-called, uh, I think in recent years, the new uh, behavior uh, re relational in international re relation proposed by the International Organization Journal um, in 2017s. Here, I just want to uh, make a, a few uh, points to uh, summarize the uh, the theoretical contributions of uh, Karen's book, uh, uh, at least here, is, is a three uh, theoretical contributions, but I think there's more. Uh, so for the 10 minutes, uh, uh, I want to uh, assure uh, my personal uh, understanding to, to uh, the Chinese uh, students, uh, especially I think it's very important for the Chinese students. Uh, how uh, can we learn the, uh, how to study the, uh, the uh, political psychology in, in uh, Russian relations. Also, uh, next I will uh, present a few thoughts uh, for the future directions. I think it, uh, here, uh, and, and not, um, not to mention the, uh, the future directions for Professor Kenneth, I, I think it's uh, for this topic, uh, in, in, especially in my personal understandings. Uh, so here, uh, let, let's go to the first part of my uh, personal judgment. Um, I think there are at least three uh, theoretical contributions we can learn from uh, Professor Kenneth's um, uh, books uh, on reputations. Uh, so uh, the first point that I think is, uh, we try to answer how to direct a new personality theory uh, in the international relations. Uh, this is, um, I think it's a very important um, uh, question. Uh, or, or, so I think it is very, uh, th there are at least two uh, traditional approaches when, when we talk about the personality studies in international relations. Uh, this is uh, my personal con concluded from uh, the uh, established the uh, writings by uh, uh, some leading scholars, especially in the United States. Uh, I think it is started from the uh, Alexander's uh, personality study of President uh, Wilson and to the recently there are more uh, uh, recent in the development of the uh, methodology uh, um, it's really the development which focuses on the content analysis. There are at least two, I think, is a traditional approach. The first one is uh, I call it as uh, case or oriented. And the second approach, I think, is more uh, preferred to methodology oriented. So uh, the first um, uh, approach, was, in terms of the first approach, is uh, when we conduct um, uh, the personality studies uh, to uh, in the field of international relations, uh, we we try to find the new cases of the national leaders, such as uh, I think uh, uh, we are now President uh, Donald Trump is a very uh, good examples. So, 
uh, if we want to um, invent or, uh, or discover some new uh, personality theories, we need to focus on the new cases. Uh, this is the first, um, I think, is approaches, and the, the second approach is methodology oriented. So, uh, from the methodological uh, perspectives, and I think the traditional methodology may be also on us is psychoanalysis. Uh, and the reason that the methodology is they have uh, evolved into the stage of uh, use more what we call the so can uh, scientific or um, contain analysis, a uh, textual analysis based on the uh, quantitative uh, uh, analysis um, on the uh, public speech of the uh, some specific uh, U.S. president or others uh, national leaders uh, uh, on the broad. But here, I just want to summarize that, that uh, Professor Kenny's book on reputations. Uh, uh, preferred to a more uh, theoretical innovation approach to the personality studies. Uh, here, uh, well, uh, she introduced a new personality trait called self-monitoring. Uh, it was borrowed, uh, introduced from the personality theories of groups uh, to, into the international studies. Uh, but uh, here, uh, I think uh, this is really important. This is, a, is, this is a new uh, personality trait to the international uh, relation, scholars and uh, students. Uh, this uh, personality trait is, is new and also is uh, very important. Uh, Excuse me, Jiwo. Uh, 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 yeah, Karen has something uh, have okay. to lay around uh, uh, 9.15. Uh, all right. So, uh, could you just uh, uh, wrap up your uh, uh, comments in one minute? All right. Mm. Uh, so, so, this is the first point that I think is uh, very helpful to uh, develop a new uh, personality trait theories. Uh, this is the first point. Uh, the second point is it's, uh, with my historical considerations. Uh, I just want to ask uh, uh, Professor Timian's uh, questions proposed just in his comments. So here, I think Professor Kenneth had, uh, uh, set up an example that how to uh, deal with the uh, such kind of uh, pitfalls uh, called is indigenous problems. Uh, indigenous problem when we try to measure uh, some specific uh, personality traits of uh, national leaders. If we if we uh, if we measure the personality trait, uh, measure trait uh, based on the national leader's speech and his behavior, and then we use this kind of personality trait to explain the, uh, the national leader's strategic behavior. This is, uh, uh, from a strategic group, it's, uh, it's not so good. It's so-called co indigenous problems. But here also, uh, Professor uh, Karen's uh, uh, management, I think, uh, she took it, uh, I think, uh, two basic scientific method uh, to uh, measure the U.S. president uh, self monitor uh, personal trade. Uh, the uh, the first one I think is survey assessment by experts, and the second uh, is content analysis based on the RQ and the speeches of a particular uh, U.S. president. So here I think uh, this is methodological. Uh, uh, we can learn from uh, Professor Kenneth's uh, um, applications um, in his book on reputations. Uh, and the third point that I will briefly talk about is this: uh, in his in her book, so he proposed a new type of the, uh, leadership. It has detailed discussed in his book. So uh, here, I just uh, uh, do not want to address this problem uh, more detailed. So. Uh, he uh, transcended the, the traditional categories uh, based on the uh, territories of the Delft and Hodges. And he added, she added a, a more sophisticated top, uh, type of outreach with new dimensions. Uh, I call this reputational sensibility. Uh, so 
Uh, this is the first, uh, th th the third uh, point I think uh, Professor Kenneth uh, made a great contribution to, to the political psychology studies in international relations. Uh, at the last, I, I just want to propose my personal thought on the future directions. Uh, the first one is uh, because I personally I preferred to uh, to, to, to discuss or study the uh, type of outreach or the um, uh, personality trait. So here, I just uh, want to state that um, what I'm trying to see is not Professor Cannon's type of outreach is not good, but uh, personally, I'm, I'm interested in to develop a new or more sophisticated type of outreach of the uh, particular self monitor trait. Uh, because uh, to briefly, uh, we can see that what I have done. So I tried to develop the self monitory a new type, uh, a new types. Uh, because uh, if we can, uh, uh, if we see the matrix, there are two dimensions. Uh, the first one is self harmonious. There are two values. Uh, the second dimension is uh, relation harmonious. There are two values. So. Uh, According to the two dimensions that I proposed here, so there are at least the four sections, uh, four sections, uh, including the high self monitors and the low self monitors. Uh, but the, the, here, the section two and the section three, uh, I'm uh, still wondering. Yes, um, in Professor Kenneth's books, uh, the higher or so low self monitors is uh, is something more like the situation oriented or self oriented uh, self monitors. So I just want to hear to develop a more uh, sophisticated type of origin of uh, the specific uh, uh, personality trait proposed, uh, introduced by Professor Kenneth. And the last two points I just want to state here is the first, uh, the second, uh, the third is. Should we consider there may be multiple repetitions when we discuss the problems to answer the who fight for repetitions and when the national needle try to answer the virtuous reactions in the international crises? Uh, Professor Kenneth's focus is mainly on the reputation for reserve. I think it, uh, uh, there may be uh, matter level limitations uh, when the national need to, to deal with the to push uh, pursue the, the uh, reputations uh, when uh, reaction and uh, react, reacted in the international crisis. Mm. She has discussed the general uh, second interpretations, uh, the differences uh, in the conclusion part, I think, in the books. I think there may be we need to show the consider more on the long term other uh, reputations and the crisis reputations, which is the reputation for reserve. Uh, I still wonder if there are any interactions between the different um, uh, levels, uh, reputations when the leader, they take care of the crisis, they um, make a decision to use force or not. Um, so this is the second, I think, second point, I think uh, we should uh, consider in the future directions. And the last, uh, the last as uh, briefly stated, uh, my personal understanding is in uh, Professor Kenneth's book, she seems make an assumption that uh, the, the self monitor trade is a variable when, when we compare the different uh, leaders, either the United States uh, president or uh, different leaders all across the world. But uh, uh, I still wonder is there any possibility? Uh, I do agree with the self monitor trade as a personality trade is stable, it's a stable in, in essential. But uh, in realities, uh, I think they may be some variations uh, to one specific uh, national leader or United States uh, president. So there may be several reasons, several reasons, I think. Uh, so 
So, so, so I just want to explore the, whether there are uh, any mechanism or variations to one specific uh, national need uh, self monitoring tree. Uh, Okay, that, 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 that's my uh, comments. Uh, so okay. I think okay. there may be no more questions. Uh, just, okay. uh, I just want to okay, do some so, personal analysis. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Karen has uh, mm -hmm. some uh, emergency at school uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, she has to leave uh, immediately. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there, uh, you know, uh, Professor I, Zhang- I can, answer, I can answer the question and stay until uh, 9.30 and then I have to. Uh, to hop off. Uh, do you want me to uh, answer some of the questions? Yeah, please uh, keep your watch by yourself. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, so. uh, this is great. I uh, really, really appreciate uh, those comments and insights and uh, remind, again, I'm so happy that I get to talk about the work uh, as opposed to all the administrative things I have to do for the rest of the week. Um, so yes, so a couple of important things. Uh, the the question of the uh, low self monitor, the difference between the hawks um, and why there's no case on it. Um, so as I, you know, you're right. I mean, this was really disappointing in the sense that we couldn't find a case that we would have act, you know, would have had access to in the uh, in terms of archival documents. And um, uh, but the Weinberger Reagan comparison allows me to do this. They're not most presidents, but Weinberger is the low uh, self-monitor hawk and will and, and the comparison with Reagan looking at the uh, especially the Lebanon case uh, really revealed very nicely uh, the differences in terms of why uh, and how they approach issues of reputation for resolve. So, but I totally agree with you that would have been better if we just had another case um, on that. Um, I think that uh, the issue that you brought up um, about the leaders' uh, uh, concerns about their own reputation and reputation of the country is also something that uh, needs further exploration. Under what conditions we see more alignment versus under what conditions less so, and what are the implications of that? That's a great question for future research. Um, I also agree that we need to find a better way to, to, to quickly code the self-monitoring of leaders. Um, obviously, intelligence organizations, or hopefully those who read the book, are now doing this on the on foreign leaders. But we need to, in the, in the scholarly community, be able to, to do this quickly. And, and I really, I mean, it, it is a great point, and I wish I had an answer to this. There are... Uh, on issues of how to apply this to uh, authoritarian leaders versus uh, or non-democracies versus democracies and all of that, the issues are are very, very interesting uh, because my argument is that it's not that the domestic audience. And so people when think about domestic audience costs, they think about domestic audience, but the concerns about reputation for resolve and militarized interested disputes of leaders are not driven by the perceptions of the domestic audience, but it's the perception of other leaders, right? So in that sense, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about a democratic, uh, a leader of a democracy or a leader in a non-democracy. I think those straight will have a similar effect. And if anything, you will see much more of a powerful effect of self-monitoring on leaders of non-democracies uh, in authoritarian regimes, where leaders have much more influence over foreign policy, so uh, and less of a pushback. So I think that this variable applied to leaders of countries that are non-democratic is going to be even more significant, mm -hmm. and I think it's 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 an interesting way of doing it. Now, for leaders of democracies, they have a way of dealing with this international versus uh, domestic audiences. So you can see this very clearly in the, in the Reagan years, where Reagan, in some, era, in some cases, faced opposition from the public to go for these adventures uh, 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 overseas. But he really, as a high self-monitor, he really wanted to show the Soviets that he is resolved. So that what he did was what we call in the literature audience segregation. 
How do you segregate the domestic from the international, right? And what we and, and in practice, the way to do this is through covert action, because covert action allowed him to hide this from the domestic audiences that did not want to see him go after the, the, the Russians, the Soviets. But he still, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the Soviet leaders knew exactly what he was doing uh, in all of those places, right? So there was a way for him to show resolve without, uh, uh, with kind of uh, hiding the domestic audiences who are not happy with what he's doing. So that's audience segregation. Then it's a, it's a tactic that high self-monitor leaders employ uh, when they want to show resolve. Um, I love the comments about how this is not a variable. Like this is it, and that actually helps with the endogeneity. Because it's a stable trait and you are born with it, there is, it's not something that you can do to change it. So in, in one sense, it's good because it's stable. If that started changing over time, methodologically, we would not have been able to, uh, to really use this as, a, as an independent variable. But it also means that it cannot explain very well changes over time within the same leader, right? Because if that trait doesn't change, then we should not see fluctuation in leaders' uh, propensity to fight for reputation over time. So those cases where we do have fluctuations are interesting cases to study. And I talk about the book when you will see this. And, and I, I argue that there is learning. I mean, this model does not preclude us from, uh, or preclude leaders from learn, right? Leaders could say, I, you know, as a high self monitor, they're much more likely to fight for resolve. And they do this in time T, but then they face this kind of huge backlash because it didn't work and it didn't produce them the kind of image that they wanted. So you see them being much more reluctant in how they employ the military means the next time. So it doesn't mean that there's no learning, but it is true that uh, uh, it's not a variable that changes the self-monitoring over time at the leaders uh, at the leader level, and that's also what's good about it because it makes it constant, and and therefore I'm less concerned about endogeneity. Um, so those are the kind of some of the I mean obviously it doesn't get it to all of the amazing questions and insights you had, but it's. It's just to show that there is a lot more that can be done. And the last thing I would say that what I would love to see from students, and maybe that's a good uh, note to end, is to think about, I study this in the context of militarized disputes with reputation for resolve is the social currency. But there are so many other areas that uh, students can take now the measurement of the US president's as high or low self minder and apply it to different issue areas where the social currency is not reputation for resolve, it's other types of reputation and see whether they get the kind of, you know, they can generate prediction and show the differences uh, in other domains when resolve is not the social currency, but it's other types of reputation that matter more. So I think that that's, I've done like half of the work already by coding the leaders and it can, you know, it can just apply to a different domain and maybe get something uh, interesting out of it. All right, it's we're out of time. It's nine thirty, uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody for um, being with us, for uh, for giving me this opportunity to present the book, and for wonderful uh, and insightful comments. And I'm um, and uh, thank you. Really, am excited about this, and I hope to visit China soon. Uh, and be with you in person. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Karen, uh, for giving us a so uh, rich, uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, you know, very busy time, I know. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, is uh, the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, book talk in our series, The Frontier of uh, International Relations Theory, sponsored by POP and, uh, you know, all institutions and uh, today uh, thank you so much and uh, you know uh, Karen uh, Jiu and uh, Qingming uh, for joining us. Uh, we have actually more than 200 uh, uh, online audience and there are 
still 10 questions in the chatting rooms waiting for your answer but i know your time is limited so so much for today uh, have I, a nice I weekend maybe a confusion because on my calendar it says that it ends at 9 30 that's why <laughs> okay okay thank you so much uh for making this uh, uh impossible um and you know uh, columbia global center including uh for all of you uh to attend this uh you know exciting uh book talk uh, tonight. Uh, have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank Hope you. to Thank see you, you in person. Take yeah, care. Yeah, right. Look forward to you. See you in person <laughs> in the yes. near future. So wherever we come to Peking University. Thank you, Karen. We'll yeah. Definitely will come. Thank bye you, Lydia. Lydia and Helena. Thank you so much. Thank you very bye -bye. much for organizing. Bye-bye.